Hebrews chapter 8 is kind of a, a little intermission between Hebrews chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, it's going to kind of set up what we're going to be talking about in chapter 9. Um, a, a lot about the Old Covenant, a lot about the priesthood, a lot of those things. And so chapter 8 is just kind of a preview of this. It's kind of uh, trying to sum up what's been said so far and kind of a, um, a prelude to what's going to be said. And so uh, you'll, you'll get some of this like next week. We'll come back and talk about this. Where we left off last week, and as we kind of come into chapter 8, because the first thing he says, here's what we've been saying so far. Here, here's what we've been teaching, so you understand this. Last week, uh, when we left, uh, when we left off, basically what he's talking about, and this is where the Jews would have been just completely scandalized, is he says, the priesthood is completely ineffective, the law is weak and useless, and the old covenant that you have lived in and loved and worshiped is over. It's gone. Now, that's difficult. It's difficult for us to understand that and feel that because we're not old covenant believers. We, we focus a lot on the new covenant, and we should. And he's going to talk about that in the next few chapters, why the new covenant is so great and why we need to focus on that and, and why it replaces the old covenant. But, but I want to spend just a minute and really kind of get you to think about this because could you imagine someone coming in and telling you that everything that you've believed and everything that you've done and all the ways that you've worshiped are over? Like, no more. Now, you would think, well, they should know that because they believe in Jesus, right? They accepted Jesus and came out of Judaism. Well, kind of, kind of. Uh, that was the problem that had followed them around. You know, we've been talking about, they have Jewish families that are persecuting them and saying, if you'll just come back, if you'll just come back and believe and just come back and go to temple and just come back and do this stuff, all this stuff will end. The problem is that they had not really ever fully left Judaism. Uh, and, and, and so what, what's happening is, is the writer of Hebrews comes to them and says, look, that day's over. It's gone. Uh, he's basically echoing what Paul says in the book of Galatians. And, and what he says in Galatians is, if you go back to the law, you have severed yourself from Christ. If you go back and try to have works of the law and make yourself righteous by the law and make yourself in relationship to God with the law, you're cutting yourself off from Christ, which is funny because his entire argument is talking about circumcision, and so he's using that idea of circumcision where, hey, they're telling you to circumcise yourself. Well, you go back to the law and you're going to do that, except you're just going to circumcise yourself completely away from Christ. And that's what's happening here. He's trying to help them understand that you can't be a little bit in Jesus and a little bit in Judaism. You can't stand in both places. You can't have it both ways. You can't pray to Jesus, but then come back to the synagogue and offer rituals and sacrifices and prayers and all that. You can't do it. It's all or nothing. So in chapter eight, we're going to be dealing with that a little bit. Um, and it's going to kind of get us moving forward um, to chapter nine. And I, I will tell you um, next week, I'm going to be super pumped. Hebrews chapter nine and 10 are like two of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And that's saying a lot because I love a lot of chapters in the Bible. Um, so come ready. I'm, I'm going to be ready next week. But Hebrews chapter 9 is super awesome. Now, let's read in chapter 8. And again, if you have questions, comments, whatever, please don't hesitate. Um, if you haven't got a handout, we have handout, handouts on both counters so you can follow along. Uh, but let's start. Now, the main point and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which, he's been which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need or no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, God says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. I did not care for them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with them, will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart and their minds. I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord for all will know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I'll be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever's becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to disappear. So it's pretty powerful stuff that he's talking about here. And so the first thing that we get is here's what he says. Here's what we've been trying to say. Here's what we've been trying to tell you. And he's going to tell them basically four things. The first thing that he's going to tell them is this. This is what we've been telling you. We have such a high priest. Now, at the end of uh, the whole chapter 7, remember we talked about Melchizedek and the priesthood and all that kind of stuff and how Jesus is better and he's greater. Uh, he's better than all the priests that are out and around and he's better than the Levitical priesthood and the, the family of Aaron. Here's what the guy's saying. Here's what the writer says. This is what we've been trying to tell you. Don't leave Jesus and go back to these people who can do nothing to save you. Don't leave Jesus and go back to these people who, you know, they have to have an offering for their sin before they can ever pray to God on your behalf. Don't leave Jesus, the only one who has the power to do anything about your life, and go to these guys who can do nothing. And in fact, the priesthood at that time and most times in the nation of Israel's life, they were corrupt. They weren't even doing what they were supposed to be doing anyway. And so here's what he says. Listen, here's what we're trying to say. You have a great high priest. You have a high priest that you don't need to walk away from. You have a high priest that you don't need to worry about. You have a high priest that isn't corrupt. This is the high priest we have, not the Levitical priests, Jesus. Now, he kind of unpacks this a little bit and talks about why Jesus is a much better high priest and why we should trust him more than we trust the other priests. And so the first thing he tells us is, the reason he's such a high priest is he's taken his seat. Now we're going to get in this in chapter 10, but we'll, we'll kind of talk about it a little bit now. It says that he's taken a seat. Now, when you get done from a long day at work and you sit down, what does that mean? What does that mean? Are you going back to work? Your work's done. Here's what he's saying. We have a high priest who finished his work. Now, in chapter 10, what he's going to say is he's going to bring this back up and say, well, we have these human priests and they stand daily ministering to God. They stand daily. They have to stand because their work isn't done. We have a high priest who sits down. His work is finished. Now, we're going to dig into that more in just a second, but the reality that he's talking about here is these guys have to stand every day and they have to keep doing these things every day because what they offer never takes away sin. It covers, it keeps God from, you know, blowing out in anger and burning everybody up, but it doesn't take away sin. And so here's why we have a better high priest. Jesus has accomplished his work He's finished his job, and here's what he does now. He sits down. His job is over. His work is done. Now, we're going to find out in a second that his ministry is actually just starting, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, he takes a seat, but not, any, not just any seat. Listen to what it says. Verse 1, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Now, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there has never been a human priest, a human pastor, a human, you know, preacher that has ever sat at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. They've created thrones for themselves, you know, and you've seen that, but our high priest, the great high priest, has a seat that nobody else can occupy. His seat is at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Now, 
Um, we, we looked at this when we talked about uh, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, where we talk about the Son of Man. Um, I know that's been a lot of weeks ago, and you've slept a couple of times since then. But in Daniel chapter 7, we see someone who's called into the presence of God. And this person's called the Son of Man, and he enters into the presence of the Ancient of Days. And the Ancient of Days requires people to worship the Son of Man, to lift him up, to praise him. And one of the ways that they worship him is the Ancient of Days gives him a throne. And guess where the throne is? At his right hand. So we have this high priest who has accomplished his work. He sits down from his work because it's done. And the seat that he sits in is in the very presence of the Father. And he sits at the right hand of power. Now that's pretty awesome. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of like when, when you want a priest, you want someone that has the ear of God, right? You want someone that has access to God. What he's basically saying is Jesus has the bat phone to God. Do y'all remember that in the old Batman movie? Uh, Batman, Batman TV show with Adam West, when they needed him, they would call the bat phone, you know, the thing, and it would light up and, hello, it's Batman. Jesus has that. He doesn't have the bat phone. He has the Jesus phone. He sits right next to God in his very presence. He has access and closeness to God. Now, remember, when we talk about the earthly priesthood, these guys don't have that access, do they? They don't. They get to enter into the Holy of Holies one time a year, and they have to really make sure that they've done everything to prepare to go in the Holy of Holies, right? They got to give sacrifices for themselves, and they got to do prayers, and they got to do all this kind of stuff. And even then, they tie a rope around their legs because if there's something that they didn't get covered and they get behind the Holy of Holies, God's going to strike them dead. And so everybody else has to pull them out so they don't have to go inside. Jesus doesn't wear a rope around his leg. Jesus doesn't worry about entering into God's presence because he sits at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Now, he's finished his work. He sits at the right hand of the Father and his ministry is very different than the earthly priests. Verse two, he's a minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched or made, not mankind. So like, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but so the temple that they were used to, the Holy of Holies, the Ark, all of that stuff was a copy. It was a shadow. The, the problem is they made, they made that the whole thing. We worship this. And God's like, no, it's a shadow. You worship me. And so what he's saying here is, and the people get caught up with this and they say, oh, well, there must be the exact replica of that in heaven. No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is Jesus ministers in a way that nobody else does. Jesus doesn't need the Holy of Holies. He doesn't need the Ark of the Covenant. He doesn't need sacrificial lambs. He doesn't need bulls and goats. He doesn't need any of that stuff because he is all that stuff. Jesus is the Holy of Holies. Jesus is our Ark of the Covenant. And so Jesus is in the presence of God. And here's where Jesus does his ministry. Now, he's not saying that what he did on earth wasn't ministry. We're going to get to this in a minute. What he's saying is, is that when we think of ministry, we think of priests and we think of them doing tasks, prayers, incense, sacrifice. Jesus didn't do any of that, did he? That's not where he worked. In fact, we're going to find out in a second, he couldn't have worked in the temple. Remember? He's not Levitical. He's not from Aaron. Here's the thing. Everything that Jesus did here on earth was to prepare him for the ministry he was going to have in heaven. The, the stuff that he did here made it so that he would go into heaven with his blood. Now, remember, it says that these priests need to offer gifts and sacrifices and our, and our priest needs to offer something. Well, Jesus offers something that they don't. He offers himself. He offers his blood. And where did he take it? He didn't take it into the temple. He didn't splash it on the Holy of Holies. He took it into the very presence of God in heaven and poured it out in front of God and in the true tabernacle, in the real sanctuary. 
That's where his ministry is. Now, we have heard already that Jesus' ministry for us is intercession, prayer, coming to God on our behalf to get the things that we need from God. And that's his ministry. And everything he did here on earth prepared for that. So we have a really great high priest. And what he's trying to get them to understand is the priests that they were dealing with in their daily life were never going to measure up to Jesus. And unfortunately, the priests that they were dealing with in their daily life were corrupt and didn't want them to get close to God, didn't want them to grow in their faith. They wanted to keep them locked under the law and in legalism. And so we have this wonderful high priest who comes and gives himself for us. He pours out his blood for us. He finishes his work on the cross. He rises from the dead. He ascends into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father and starts his ministry as our priest. And his ministry as our priest is praying for us, interceding for us, for God to give us the grace and mercy and help in our time of need. Pretty cool. Now, the second thing that he tries to tell us, he says, Jesus offers a more excellent ministry. We, we see that uh, in verse six. He's attained a more excellent ministry. Why? Well, jump back up here in verse three. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it's necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, I just thought this was funny as I was reading this, the way he portrays this, and he's right. The priests have to offer something, right? That's their job. They, priests, represent God to us and represent us to God. And so it's their job to offer gifts and sacrifices. And gifts, we talked about this a few weeks ago, the gifts of God, God's word, and prayer, and all those kind of things, and sacrifices for sin. So our priest needs to offer something. I want you to think about this for just a second. When you go to an earthly priest or a pastor, whatever they offer you is not theirs to offer. Like, I can only give you the gifts that God's given me. Like, I, I can't create something and give it to you. Jesus, on the other hand, has a more excellent ministry because when he offers gifts and he offers sacrifices, he actually has something to offer. The first thing that he offers is himself. Like, no priest at any point, and listen, as much as I love you guys, I'm not dying for you. Sorry. And if I did, it wouldn't do you any good, <laughs> right? But he does, and he can. And so here's what he offers us. He, he comes to us and says, I want to give you a sacrifice that actually takes away sin. I want to give you a sacrifice that actually forgives you and covers you. And not just that, I want to give you a sacrifice that closes the, different, the distance between you and God. And that's the biblical word we use called reconciliation. Where we close the distance and now we have a relationship with God. And then, it's not just that he wants to offer sacrifices, he wants to give gifts. And so these guys come along and they, you know, give us gifts of prayers and, you know, their prayers and those kind of things, which, listen, I, I don't want to dismiss that. It's great to have people praying for us. But how much better is it when Jesus gives us the gift of, I'm praying for you. I actually know what you need. And I'm sitting in the presence of my father and I can ask him to give you what you need and he's going to hear my prayer and answer that. But that's not just the gift. He also gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember, he's talked about that, the gift of the Holy Spirit. No priest can do that. I can't do that. But our great high priest who has a completely different and more excellent ministry can. And so here's the gift that he gives you. You're not going to be alone. I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to implant God inside of you. And we're going to get to that more in a minute, but that's a gift. Then he gives us the gift of the fruit of the Spirit. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. He gives that to us because that is not natural to us. He gives us gifts of the Spirit for the common good of the church, 1 Corinthians 12, called spiritual gifts. So listen, don't walk away from Jesus because Jesus offers you something that these guys can't. Now, we talked about this a minute ago, but here's what he says. Verse four. Now, if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, God says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Now, we're not saying that the temple's bad. Not saying that the Holy of Holies is bad. Not saying that the Ark of the Covenant, none of that's bad. But it wasn't the point. The point was to see these things and recognize there's a distance between us and God that we can't pass. No matter how many times you go on the Day of Atonement and you sacrifice a bull or goat or whatever it is, you're not getting behind the Holy of Holies. You're not getting in God's presence. But with Jesus that all changes. He closes the distance between us and God. So those things are not bad. They're just to point past themselves to God. Same way with the law. The law is not bad. The law is good. Paul says in Romans 7, the law is good, it's holy, it's just, it's righteous. The problem is not the law. The problem is us. So here's what he says. People were saying, okay, if Jesus is so great, why didn't he serve at the temple? If Jesus was called by God, why didn't he show up at the temple and all the priests at the temple accept him? And here's what the guy's saying. That's not his ministry. His ministry is not to serve you here on earth. His ministry is to come and to provide a sacrifice to, to save you and take that blood and that forgiveness into heaven to do the ministry that he's been called to do, which is to intercede for us and pray for us and give us gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, look, you can ask for him to be like a regular priest and it's not gonna happen, and you don't want that. And then it says that he's the mediator of a new covenant. Look at verse six. He's obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. So we're going to hear a lot about this in Hebrews 9 and 10. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. But basically, here's what he's saying is that Jesus gives a new covenant to us and he's the one that determines the conditions. He's the one that sets it up. He's the one who determines who's in and who's not. And he's the one that determines how everything works out in that covenant. That's what a mediator means. There's someone who stands between us and God. And so Jesus is our mediator. Now, there's two things that he says here. It's a better covenant with better promises. Now, we're going to unpack this a little bit more in just a minute with the old covenant. We're going to hit it hard in Hebrews 9. But this is going to be hard for us to hear, okay? I just want to tell you this up front. It's hard for them to hear. Because again, the old covenant, the law, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments are not bad. They're not wrong. The only problem with that law is it could not save us. There was nothing inside of it that could save us. Paul even talks about this in Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 4. He says that if there was a law that could have saved us, Jesus would have never died. He said, but the law, the purpose of the law, the purpose of the old covenant was to show us our need for a savior. The law, all it can do is point out where you fail. Do you ever feel bad when you go back and you read the Old Testament and you start reading the Ten Commandments and you're like, yeah, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. You get into Leviticus and there's all this stuff about you should do this, not do this. And you're like, don't do that, don't do that. Like, do you ever just feel like, who has any hope, right? That's the point. The law, its only point 
is to show us that we are sinners and that we cannot save ourselves. And then it points past itself for us to cry out to God to go, God, save us. And that's where the Messiah comes in. So he's the mediator of a better covenant based on better promises. Now, I know I'm hitting a lot of Old Testament stuff and uh, Charlie and I were talking about this today. It is really hard to read the book of Hebrews if you don't understand the Old Testament. Because the writer of Hebrews is writing to people who grew up studying the Old Testament, memorizing the Old Testament. And so when he would throw out a, a, a quote of a verse, they're like, yep, I know exactly where that's from. Now, just a minute ago, I read this about the tabernacle and I'll be honest, I didn't know where that was from. I had to look it up. Let me tell you where that reference is from. It was from Exodus 25, verse 40. But the people that day would have understood it. And so when he talks about better promises, it's like, what better promise could there be than what the law said that, that, you know, that if we follow these commands, we'll be blessed. If we don't follow these commands, then we'll be cursed. And it's like, yeah, you're right. What could be better than that? Did you experience a lot of blessing in your life? If you've read the Old Testament, did the Israelites experience a lot of blessing in their life? What did they experience? Cursing. Why? Because they were disobedient. Here's the promise. I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I'm going to give you a law, and if you keep the law, you'll be blessed. If you don't keep the law, you're going to be cursed. Isn't that a lot of pressure? It's a lot of pressure. The new covenant is based on better promises. And here's the better promise. Your relationship with God has nothing to do with your obedience. It has everything to do with his grace. Your relationship to God is not based on what you do. It's based on what Jesus has done for you. We talked about this a little bit last week that Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish the law. You have to say, well, Jesus, what do you mean by that? Here's what he means. When Jesus lived on this earth, he was fulfilling the law for you and for me. Because I've already said it, and I don't know if you get it. Do you keep the law? Anybody? I don't. So Jesus comes and he fulfills the law for us. In fact, what it says, he fills it to the full. So here he comes. He's the mediator of a better covenant. And here's the promise. Getting into heaven, being in relationship with God has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with what Jesus did. Here's a better promise. Having relationship with God Having blessing from God has nothing to do with your obedience, but whether you're in Christ or not. All the blessings come by being in Christ. In fact, in Ephesians 1, Paul tells us that God in Christ has filled us up with all spiritual and heavenly blessings. We get that in Jesus. So he offers us a more excellent ministry. Number three thing that he wants us to know. Why do we need a new covenant? <clears throat> Remember, these people have been entrenched in the law. And so to hear that the law is moving away, that we don't need the law, the law is weak and useless, that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. And so, you know, and they're, they're going home and talking to their parents. And, you know, I, I can just hear them being like, what are they teaching you at that church? <laughs> the law is good. Yeah, you're right. The law is good. The law can't save. And so one of the things that the writer has been trying to tell these people so they can tell their family and also tell themselves, why do we need a new covenant? Now, in verses um, 8 through 12, uh, we're getting a full quote from Jeremiah 31. This is uh, Jeremiah 31, I think 12 through 15, 12 through 14. Um, but this is a pretty powerful thing because, you know, what would happen is you can imagine as they're hearing this and they would be like, you know, those, those people at the church are crazy. 
They're, they're just teaching you nonsense. This, this has never been said before. This is not what God said. Mm, okay, let's jump back into Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is writing to people who are in slavery because they've disobeyed the law and they've continued to reject God. And because of that, they go into slavery and they're in slavery for about 70 years before God brings them back. And here's what Jeremiah says. There is a day that's coming where the old covenant's gone. Something better is happening. And we have to wait hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this happens. So one of the things that needs to happen here, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, this isn't new. This isn't new. This isn't something that I've made up. This isn't something that Paul makes up because Paul says the same thing. In fact, this is in multiple places in the Old Testament. Let me give you two. Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. Both of them were written to people who were in captivity. Both of them were in captivity because they rejected God and broke his law and continued to break his law. And here's the promise. I'm going to save you. And when I save you, I'm going to change this covenant because you can't keep the covenant. I'm going to do something new. So here's what he says in verse 7. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them. Now, it's not finding fault with the covenant. He's finding fault with the people who are in the covenant. God says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and, not, and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now he's going all the way back to delivering them out of Egypt, right? I made a covenant with them for they did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. I will write them on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not teach everyone, his fellow citizen, everyone, his brother, saying, know the Lord. Basically what it's saying is you're not going to go around teaching people because everyone will know him. For all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. So, here's what he says. Why do we need a new covenant? Well, the first covenant wasn't faultless. And again, not a problem with the covenant. It's a problem with us. We couldn't keep it. And so he says, listen, there's a, a day coming for a new covenant. And isn't it funny that the people who heard this in Jeremiah and the people who heard this in Ezekiel and the Pharisees who had been teaching it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years didn't get it? They didn't get it. They rejected Jesus because they said, well, wait a second, you're changing everything. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm not saying anything that Jeremiah didn't say. I'm not saying anything that Amos didn't say. I'm not saying anything that Hosea didn't say or Abraham or Moses. I'm saying the same. You just didn't get it. And so listen, can you imagine what freedom it would have given them had they understood back then that God was going to do something to bring grace and mercy into their life? Again, it's hard for us to connect to that because all we've ever known is grace and mercy. But could you imagine having to, li to literally live under the law? Having to live under the law and then once a year, like we talked about last week and we're going to talk about again, where you had to go stand out on the line with people and you have your animal there that you're going to go sacrifice so everybody knows all the sin that you've committed. You got a, you got a pretty big cow there. You didn't have a great year. And the whole time as you're walking forward, recognizing that I'm going to go sacrifice this animal. And guess what? It's not going to do anything. It's not going to forgive my sin. It's not going to wash away my sin. Yes, it will cover me for another year. But my sin is still there. Could you imagine then hearing that God wants to do something new and what he wants to do is give you a better promise and give you a better covenant, a covenant based on grace and mercy. So he says, it's not like the first covenant. And this is where it's tough. The first covenant, for lack of a better word, was an outside covenant. Didn't matter about your heart. Here's the list of rules. Here's the do's and the don'ts. Do it. Don't do it. So it was outside, no heart change, no transformation. It was all behavior modification. And we couldn't even do that. In fact, what he says here is, is that 
Here's the covenant I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt. And what happened when he brought them out of Egypt? They obeyed his commands and they got to go to the promised land and they experienced generations of blessing and healthy marriages and, and some protection and peace, right? Is that, that's what happened? Is that, is that what I'm, am I remembering that correctly? No, what happened? Like six and a half minutes out, they get out, out of Egypt. And everybody's like, we want to go back. This is awful. Take us back. We got food there. And God's literally raining food on them. They get to a place where God is saying, here, I want to lead you into the promised land. I want to take you into this place. And they say, no, we're not going. We're scared. And God says, okay, you get to walk in a circle for 40 years. <laughs> like, could you imagine? It's bad enough going anywhere with family. And then you hear, are we there yet? <laughs> are we there yet? Can you imagine 40 years? Like, I saw that tree before. <laughs> yeah, bud. We've seen that tree a lot. Hey, look, there's that bush I saw the other day. Yeah, I know. So they immediately broke it and continually broke it. 40 years, going to the promised land. God says, I need you to get these people out so they don't contaminate you. And they go, nah. And they don't do it. And they get contaminated. And all sorts of junk starts happening. So here's what he says. It's not like that covenant. It's not based on your obedience. It's not based on how well you perform. It's based on what Christ has done for you. Now, he says something in here that is heartbreaking. He says, <laughs> verse 9, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. I did not care for them. <laughs> like, let that settle in for a second. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It doesn't mean that God didn't love them. It means that because of the covenant that he had made with them, they had to suffer the consequences of their disobedience. It was all on them. And so God had to pull back his care and his provision of them because of the sin that they were in. So they had famine and they had drought and they had war and they had slavery and they had all this stuff. Like that's a, whoa, like I did not care for them. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that God just came to the place and was like, yeah, I don't care for them anymore. Because clearly he did because he brought them out and he saved them and he did. But, but here's what he's saying. Because of that covenant and that covenant's based on your obedience and you were disobedient, I could not do the things for you that I wanted to do. I could not care for you in the way that I wanted to care for you. So I'm going to give you a new covenant where I can show you care. And so here's what he says. Verse 10, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law into their mind. I will write them on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. They shall not teach every, every, everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The new covenant that I'm going to give you is going to be on the inside. It's not going to be on the outside. Now, this isn't a trick question. I, I want you to think about this. What was the original old covenant? We'll say the Ten Commandments. What was the original covenant written on? Stone. What's the new covenant written on? Our hearts. So the Israelites loved the Ark of the Covenant because it, it contained the stones, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. But that's on the outside. God says, I don't want that kind of relationship with you. What I want is on the inside. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write my law in your mind and on your heart. Now, those two words in Jewish thought and even in Jesus' day really doesn't mean like brain and our heart organ, you know. What it means is the deepest part of who we are, that place that makes us who we are. And so here's what he says. I want to write my love and my law in the deepest part of who you are. Because when I write it in there, guess what happens? Change. There's change that happens. It transforms you. 
It creates intimacy with God. This new covenant, this new relationship um, creates intimacy with God. There's no barriers between us and him. There's no holy of holies. There's no curtain. There's no ark of the covenant. There's no priesthood. There's none of that stuff. We now are his people. In fact, here's what he says. I will be their God and they will be my people. creates intimacy. Even more than that, when he talks about not being a teacher, is that we don't need a priestly class. We don't need special people to stand between us and God because now we have a relationship with God. We can approach him. We can pray to him. We can hear from him. We can read his word and the spirit teaches us. Remember what Jesus says? The Holy Spirit will remind us of everything that Jesus said and lead us into truth and teach us all the things that Jesus said. So here's the deal. We get this intimacy with God that we never had before. And we can't have in any other way. And this intimacy creates in us the opportunity to have what we as Baptists call the priesthood of all believers. Now, if you haven't been Baptist long or you haven't heard that, it's a very wonderful thing. And I wish, you know, people knew it more, but here's what it means. We believe, based on teachings like this, that when you come to faith in Jesus and God forgives you of your sins and gives you the Holy Spirit, the new life in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that when that happens, that you are able to be a priest before God. You don't have to come to me to pray. You don't have to come to me for me to do a little sign or something to forgive your sins. You just go to God. Hebrews 4. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need. That's what we believe. And I I love that. That's one of the reasons why I'm a Baptist is that you can read the Bible for yourself and let the Holy Spirit teach you. You don't need me to do that. So we stand before God as his child, but also as his priest. Now, you can't have that. You can't have the the good stuff without the responsibilities. Part of the priesthood of the believer is this, whose responsibility is it to go and share the gospel? Well, that's yours, Michael, because we we pay you to do that. (laughs) Who are the priests of God? 1 Corinthians 12, we talk about it all the time. Who are the ministers at our church? You are. So he creates this intimacy with God that not only has a relationship, but we get responsibility. And then he says, and I can only imagine as they're reading this in their Sunday gathering, the people hearing this, and it's coming from Jeremiah, where God would be merciful to their sins. Again, unfortunately, this doesn't shock us and awe us as it should. But could you imagine being someone who has built their entire identity and existence on trying to be good and trying to keep the law and trying to do all these things and failing miserably to hear that God himself say, I will be merciful to your sins. He doesn't hold our sins against us. 2 Corinthians chapter five, that God does not want to hold our sin against us. See, the problem is is that the old covenant will teach you that he does. (laughs) Because there's nothing to forgive your sin. You can get covered, but you can't be forgiven. Jesus takes our place. We don't even have to pay for our sins. Now, look, I, I understand when people who are outside of Christianity don't understand that. Do you see how highly offensive that is? That we who have rebelled against God, we've committed heinous acts of sin, and now we get to have Jesus stand in our place and God pour out all his wrath and anger and justice on Jesus that we deserve and we don't get any of it? Is that fair? No, but it's good. It says, not only is God merciful to our sins, but God would remember our sins no more. That's what he says. I will be merciful to their sins, verse 12. I will remember their sins no more. 
You might want to underline that. Maybe write that on your mirror at home, put it in your wallet, memorize it. Because here's the reality. That's true. And you say, well, if that's true, why, why do I feel shame and why do I feel guilt and why do I? Because you remember. Not because God remembers. Because your inner moron loves to accuse you. Because your enemy loves to accuse you. That's, that's not God. God would remember your sins no more. Tom? Oh, we were just talking about that. Yeah, that, that we don't have to have a priestly class that goes around and teaches us that we're all priests before God because we know him now. We have relationship to him. Does that help? No? What, so what's confusing? Anybody. Anybody. Anybody, what he's, saying, what he's saying is when we get the new covenant and we enter into the new covenant, then you don't have to go and teach your neighbor to know about God. Because in the new covenant, as we come into that, the Holy Spirit enters into us and the Holy Spirit is working on all the other people too. He's not saying that we don't share the gospel or we don't go teach. What he's, yeah, he's not saying that we don't share the gospel or go teach. What he's saying is this is different than what we had before. And what we had before is you have this priestly class of people that stand above you and you can't read the word for yourself. You can't pray for yourself. You can't ask God to forgive you. And what he's saying is that's not the way it's going to be anymore. Because I will be your God and you will be my people, then you come to me. You come to me. Huh? The Old Testament the sacrifices, whenever someone sinned, they had to sacrifice. It, it seemed to me that that was a punishment. It wasn't a, it wasn't a punishment as it was, as much as it was, as much as it was a reminder. Okay, because you have these animals that you're raising. Sure. And, and sort of, and so you screw up and you have to give the prize cow, right? Sure. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. So, so that's exactly right. Yes, it, that, that's the problem. Is when in that system, the sacrifices and those things were to remind us that the sins that we committed have consequences. And, and yeah, it costs us. But the, it's also a reminder, and we're going to talk about this a lot in chapter 10. It's also a reminder as you're offering that animal, that that animal and that blood will not forgive your sin. It just allows you to continue living and not have God destroy you. And so that's why Jesus is so important. When Jesus makes that sacrifice for us and pours out his blood for us, it actually washes away our sin and cleanses our sin so that God can say, I remember them no more. Thank you. So this is important. God does not hold our sin against us. I can't tell you how many times that I have prayed to God, God, I know that you know this, and, I, you know, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I just rehearse all the things that I've done and all the things I'm ashamed of and all the things that I'm guilty of. And if I could hear God's voice, or if you could hear God's voice, here's what God says. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't remember that. He's not playing. He's not kidding. When God forgives, he forgets. Now, it doesn't, God doesn't get dementia or Alzheimer's. But here's what God does. That is not on your account anymore. You're not responsible for that anymore. And so what happens for us is we have to come to a place to forgive ourselves and to deal with those kind of things and recognize that God does not hold that against us. Tom. Yes. And I will forgive anyway. Yeah, the first one is obsolete. You make a new will, the first one's worthless. Exactly. And thank you, you've ruined chapter nine, because that's what chapter nine says. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're right. 
You're right. We're going to talk about that, that God has, it's like a will. If you make a will and you make a new will, the old will is over. doesn't matter what's contained in there. The new will is what matters. Here's the thing that I want you to see. This is important. We say things like, I'll forgive, but I won't. And we say that enough that we think that's how God does. What does God say right here? I will remember your sins no more. And I would argue, and we can talk about this in another time. We don't have time for it tonight. I would argue that when we forgive and we don't forget, we haven't really forgiven. So last thing, when God says a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Here's the fourth thing that I've been trying to tell you, and we're going to talk about it more next week. The old covenant is ready to disappear. Now, this takes some explaining, and we'll deal with this more next week. It doesn't mean that we throw out the Ten Commandments. It doesn't mean that we cut off the Old Testament. Like we have some people who say we should unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament. Well, if we do that, we won't understand the New Testament and we won't see all the fulfillment of God's promises from the Old Testament. Here's what he's saying. It's ready to disappear by we don't live by it. We don't judge our relationship to God by how we keep the law. We don't give people assurance. Like if somebody were to come to me and say, hey, Michael, I'm, I'm really struggling with my salvation. I need to know whether I believe in God. And I go, okay, um, did you um, sacrifice a turtle dove? Have you given off the first fruits of your crops that you've given? Um, are you wearing mixed fabric clothing? Well, if you, if you haven't done that, you're great because you've kept the law. No, that's not how we give assurance. We give assurance by this, Michael, I, I don't know. okay. Do you trust what Jesus has done for you? Do you recognize that Christ has died for you and Christ has paid your debt? Christ has took your place and he's resurrected to show victory over sin, death, hell, and the devil. Do you trust that? Have you asked for forgiveness? That's where assurance comes from. It's not in what we do. It's in what Christ has done. So we'll pick that up some more next week. Any questions or comments or anything before we go? Yes, Eileen. So what? Yeah. Yeah. So that's not a long answer at all. Great question. How do we relate this to those those passages that talk about confessing our sins? So here's the deal. Um, we should live a life of confession. So we begin our Christian life with confession. God, I am a sinner. I need you to save me. And that's what he does. And he washes away our sin. Now, as we continue in our relationship with Christ, we continue to sin, right? Anybody perfect right now? No. We continue to sin. And so there's not one confession that we make. Our life should be daily confession where we come and we confess our sin and say, I did this and I didn't do this and I should have done that. And, you know, God, I, I confess my sin. And then we know that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, so the reality is these things are not in opposition at all. Um, the reason that we can come and confess our sins daily and like Jesus says, Father, forgive us our debts. You know, the reason we can do that is because Christ has forgiven us. God has forgiven us. That's the basis for why we can come and do that every day, right? So we have to do it the first time, and then we have to do it all the time. Does that make sense? Ricky, did that, did that answer your, your question? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, when he says it is finished on the cross, that's exactly what he means. That all debt has been paid. All sin has been forgiven. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to just go to heaven. We have to receive that. We have to ask for that, right? 
Um, but that's what it means, is that he has dealt with sin. He's dealt with the thing that keeps us from God. He's dealt with that. It's done. Eileen? Mm-hmm. No. Yes. Great. I get what you're saying. So what Eileen was saying, and I, and I agree with that is, there are, I don't want to say different, different types of confession, but there is a confession under repentance where we confess our sins for God to save us. And then there's a confession for relationship where we say, God, forgive me of the sins I'm committing so I can stay in fellowship and relationship with you. And so like I was saying before, this one over here, the daily kind of confession that we do, only makes sense if we've done the first one. We, we can't ask for daily forgiveness if Christ had not done what he's done. And so the asking of daily forgiveness is based on us believing in once for all forgiveness. Does that make sense? So there's two different ones. Yes, we make a profession of faith, a confession. I am a sinner. I need to be saved. Christ saves me. I enter into relationship with him. My sins are forgiven. Because of that, I now want to daily to confess my sin so I can stay in close fellowship and relationship to him. And we don't have to wait till the day of atonement. We can come anytime. And that's why, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about in Thessalonians, where he talks about being blameless. And being blameless doesn't mean you're perfect. Being blameless means that you're up to date on your confession with God and your apologies to other people. And so, so here's something I would say. Like, don't wait until you get a bunch of sins to confess. Why would you do that? You're missing out on forgiveness and cleansing and healing and fellowship. Do it now, you know? What are you waiting for? Great question. Does that, does that kind of help? Okay. Is there somebody over here? Okay. Anybody else before we go? Awesome. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for your word. Oh, God, I'm so excited to see people engaged and asking questions and wanting to grow. And uh, Father, help us to really come to understand your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. That you do not hold our sin against us. God, you do not remember our sin. And because of that, we can come every day and ask for your healing and for your grace and for your forgiveness. And, and we know that you'll give it. So, Father, I, I pray tonight that we would take what we've learned and share it with somebody else who desperately needs to hear it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks.